Hello and a very warm welcome to the brand new edition of To The Point. I'm Prithi Mishra. And on today's show, my guest is Principal Scientific Advisor to Government of India, Professor K. Vijay Raghman. Sir, welcome to Rad Sabha TV and thank you so much for joining us through this virtual platform. Thank you. Sir, first, let's talk about the Filuda testing kit. Developed by India, it could be a game changer in the testing strategy for COVID, expected to be available in market for commercial purposes from October 31st. Tell us how reliable is it? Well, um, you know, this is very important for us to keep in mind what uh, testing is about and what the standards of testing are. Now, right now, the gold standard for testing is something called the RT-PCR test. That involves a instrument whose cost is about 10 to 20 lakhs. And that instrument, into that instrument comes in a swab which is taken, a nasopharyngeal swab, and that nasopharyngeal swab is processed and you get the virus's genetic material out and then you put it in the machine which gives you the readout and that readout can take a few hours but because of the kind of uh, pipeline which is there, it can take up to a day or two. Now this is a very reliable process in terms of two components. One, the sensitivity it can detect very low amounts of the virus, so this genetic material, and the specificity. It will not detect something else and call it as the virus. So this is the standard. So there are many other tests available now, which detect, for example, the coat on top of the virus. It's called the rapid antigen test. It has an advantage that it can be done speedily, but it is very low on the sensitivity. It's lower on the sensitivity. It's above 90%, uh, but still, you know, that is low because if the prevalence is low in a population, you can get a false, uh, you can miss out uh, a, a positive uh, or you can get a false positive, uh, but its sense, uh, specificity is high. Now, the Faluda test is interesting because it simplifies the RT-PCR test hugely. Instead of this 20 lakh piece of equipment which you use, you have, after extracting from the nasopharyngeal slab, uh, swab, a machine which costs anywhere from 20,000 rupees to a lakh at most. So it's a very simple machine where you crudely amplify, not as precisely as the RT-PCR machine. Then you take it to a very precise test, which uses the CRISPR-Cas9 technology, for which the Nobel Prize was got this year. And this allows a very precise, on a paper, testing whether the virus's genetic material is there or not. The sensitivity and specificity here is comparable to the RT-PCR. In other words, this test, you know, meets a very high benchmark and therefore is very valuable, but also inexpensive. So it's going to be as simple as a pregnancy testing kit? Nearly, but not yet. Remember, you still need that machine. In a pregnancy testing kit, you don't need that. In a diabetes testing kit, you don't need that. Those kinds of tests are coming soon. They will be in one variant of Faluda, instead of using this machine, you can use a chemical, what is called an enzyme, to do what that machine does. And then you can bring it in over here. That will be doable at home, but that will be a little more expensive. So there's a trade-off there. But there are other tests which are coming very soon, which will not only be simple, but you could do at home. They may not be as reliable, but they have the advantage that you can do, use them repeatedly. And therefore, even though they are less reliable, the repeated inexpensive use allows you to uh, make up for the relatively lower reliability. So this is an uncharted territory, and we do hope that this leaves an indelible impact on our testing strategy. But talking about the COVID-19 cases, sir, fortunately, we are seeing a dip now. But is it too early to say that we've flattened the curve? Well, you know, what does the dip mean? The dip today means that you're seeing the consequences of what was done a few, a month or a month and a half ago. But similarly, if there were to be a rise, Again, it will come due to our laxity now, which you will see a month later. So 
you know, it is very, very important to keep in mind that this lag should not mislead you. A lower number now doesn't mean that you should be lax. You should actually be careful if you want to keep it coming down. And, you know, as winter approaches in the more northern hemispheres particularly, we are seeing a surge in those countries. What that means in our context is much more complex uh, and in our conditions is much more complex. Nevertheless, there is no room for complacency while devising methods to go about our lives. Absolutely agree with you, sir, that there is no room for complacency. But as you mentioned about winter season approaching and also the fact that the air pollution that is enveloping us all around, there are studies that say that this could even worsen the COVID-19 situation. Would you agree? Is there a scientific approach to it? Well, you know, before I comment on that specifically about air pollution, air quality is very important for respiratory diseases in general. Nothing to do with this particular disease. In other words, if because of poor air quality, you have breathing issues, that doesn't help in your body dealing with any respiratory illness. Uh, so that's one important general point. The other point is that, you know, when there is more humidity, then at least in more northern hemispheres, the clearances of respiratory viruses in general are much better. So drier environments uh, and polluted environments can, cons uh, can complicate clearances of respiratory uh, illness uh, rather substantially. And therefore, there's no reason to think that uh, COVID-19 is different and therefore one must take care in polluted environments uh, or in uh, other such conditions. And follow all the protocols. But sir, there's this global race for vaccine development. Vaccine development. What is your assessment? What more needs to be done? And how it has to be done to ensure that whatever is the outcome or whichever vaccine we have, it is safe consumption? You know, um, it is natural for us to call it a race because we want you know, vaccines out soon. But it is a race in which those who come later past the finish post are also winners. Uh, so it's not so much about who gets a vaccine out first, but how many and how varied and how effective in different ways are the ones which go past the finishing post. Right now, there are 34 vaccines or so in phase one human trials where testing of safety and dosage is done about 14 vaccines or so in expanded uh, safety trials, which are called phase two trials, about 11 in large scale efficacy tests, they're called phase three trials, six vaccines have been approved for limited or early use through emergency authorization, mainly in Russia and China. Yes, you know, would not be used publicly in other places without trials. And we still have zero vaccines uh, for full approved use, and we expect that to happen sometime in late November or the earliest, or December or January. The reason I said it's not a race in the usual sense is that the first ones, of course, are important, and we need to simultaneously manufacture, store them, and then distribute them. But as we do that, other vaccines will come. And there is a challenge then, if number one has a certain quality, and the second one is better, uh, do you then stop administering the first and administer the second? Or if the second is slightly better, but in a different context, what do you do? If one has to be administered in two doses and the second one in three, what do you do? And if one is, you know, has to go in a cold chain and another one comes up a few months later, which is thermotolerant. So you're going to have this portfolio, which will start expanding. You'll have a luxury of many vaccines coming up by and by. So the fear of not having any will move into a management uh, uh, situation of having many and how to deal with that. These are not unmanageable situations. They're very much manageable. But, you know, a calm and labeling of all the options and what to do is needed. And that the, uh, you know, vaccine distribution group headed by Dr. Vinod Paul and the health secretary, uh, Mr. Rajesh Bhushan, are addressing that fully. Right, sir. And also, India is seen as the heart of 
vaccine development, global vaccine development. It is known as the pharmacy of the world. What is your assessment? How do you see role of India as far as vaccine for coronavirus is concerned? Well, you're absolutely right about India's uh, strong position in vaccine uh, manufacturing. India, in terms of bulk, is one of the largest vaccine manufacturers. Uh, two out of three vaccines which children all over the world get through the UNICEF immunization program are made in India. That's incredible. Indian vaccine manufacturers have saved hundreds of millions of lives, uh, most recently with the pneumococcal um, vaccines in Africa. And so Indian vaccine industry is absolutely terrific. India, however, at this pandemic, has in addition risen to the occasion by being innovative about vaccine development. All our big, medium, small vaccine manufacturers, as well as our academia and industry, have gotten into vaccine development. Now, this is very uh, creditable, and many of them will do well. Uh, this, I would say, is a situation where we have to strengthen our laboratory uh, production streams for overproducing uh, vaccine candidates for uh, putting in place animal trials so that the early stage preclinical trials can be robust, for putting in place strong clinical trial platforms which are of world class. And all this is being done by our science agencies, so it's absolutely terrific. Right, sir. You made a very important point there, and Prime Minister also says that our vaccine development program should be absolutely efficient, backed by IT, should have a lasting impact on our healthcare system. Talking about India, what are the challenges that you foresee and how do we meet those challenges? Well, you know, our vaccine uh, distribution system, for example, for polio vaccines earlier and for childhood immunization now, has won appreciation from all over the world. But we must keep in mind that the polio vaccine effort was a campaign for one vaccine. And uh, that is different from a situation now where we need a vaccine for everyone in the population or a very large part of the population. We might need to do it a couple of times. We will have priorities, so we will have to do it in waves in, in, according to priorities. And this is going to be an enormous challenge. Uh, people have pointed out, uh, the Prime Minister has pointed out, our vaccine task force people have uh, pointed out, that it is in some ways similar to the conduction of um, uh, elections. And the same kind of machinery, which involves state and central government personnel, schools as sites for you know, voting, those kinds of methodologies combined with digital identification of people, whether they've got a vaccine or not, all of that can be done. And that's exactly what the health ministry's goal is, to try and put in place such a mission, not only for vaccination, but also for vaccine distribution uh, and for the vaccine cold chain. Right, sir. Completely agree with you on that one. And shifting focus now to the Science and Policy Technology 2020. Now, the centre has been holding consultations with the state governments on this policy. What do we expect from this policy? Well, um, if you want to take science and technology to society and for economic development, then there are four pillars which need to be connected at the foundation and feed each other and need to be of the same height. So the building on which, you know, this, which uh, these, pil uh, these pillars hold up is stable and, and can grow. Those four uh, pillars are science and technology and our institutions, number one, society uh, and its aspirations, the second. Third is our industry and the way it is growing. And fourth is government policy and government funding. If there is an asymmetry in the size or strength of these pillars, then we will not be able to hold up all the weight which we want to hold up and go forward. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought out an amazing level of cooperation between these four pillars never before seen. These four pillars, quite frankly, were not, despite great exhortation, and lots of pushes about saying that we must coordinate, we must work together. That synergy grew several fold during the pandemic. So the new science and technology policy must leverage on that and leverage also on a deep link with the new national education policy. 
The new national education policy points out something very simple and important. It says that as far as research goes, that 90% of us graduate students, masters and PhD and so on, go to our state universities and colleges, whereas 10% go to our central universities and colleges. But 90% of our funding for research goes to our central universities and institutions, and only 10% to our state government institutions and elsewhere. So the science and technology policy needs to link to all over the country by providing a hub and spoke of mentorship uh, and centers for excellence in one way by attacking <coughs> problems which are relevant to the building of quality intellectual capacity in our country at the foundation. That allows this capacity to take up new kinds of programs, both basic and applied, and to take on at the third level missions which have greater impact. So what do you expect from the states? Well, there are two components which have not fed into these pillars very substantially in the past. One is industry. Industry's investment has been very small compared to what other countries do. So enabling mechanisms so that industry can partner with science and technology institutions are very important. In a similar manner, states have had science and technology ministries and departments which they have been relatively disconnected from their purpose. Some states have done an excellent job in having a better connectivity. Punjab is an example, Karnataka is an example. And those kinds of examples need to be studied and emulated and our central institutions, not only within those states, but elsewhere in a thematic manner, need to work closely with state governments so that state government investment uh, brings value into all their programs and their implementation. You underscored the importance of collaboration with the industry, but what more needs to be done to attract private investment in science and technology? Well, a very simple problem needs to be solved, and it's solvable. If you look at the level of industry R&D investment by the big multinational corporations, uh, each of them invests more in their in-house R&D than the entire budget of, for example, the US National Science Foundation, right? So these are big investors for their, their fund. And therefore, when Indian industry, you ask them to invest in R&D, Indian industry may be capital rich, but they can't compete with that level of investment in R&D. So they don't have risk cap. On the other side, though, our institutions, our science and technology institutions, have got enormous quality of people, enormous infrastructure, a lot of land which can be used for partnership with industry. And these three allow risk mitigation for industry so that a partnership between industry and Indian science and technology can mitigate that risk and allow their industry's investment in R&D be more internationally competent. Professor Raghavan, with that kind of partnership, we are looking at a paradigm shift in agriculture, rural development, urban development, financial inclusion with scientific interventions. What's the way ahead? You know, that, um, you know, I don't like to use typically these phrases like paradigm shift, but this is indeed true in this case. One example is the Indian Space uh, Research Organization. It has recently restructured itself and created a structure called InSpace, which vets industry proposals, entrepreneurs, big industry, small industry, international, Indian, so that you know they will then be cleared uh, in competition with anyone for launching satellites through ISRO. And ISRO will take that up and do that both in collaboration and on payment. So this will completely transform space-related industry in, in many ways, which will transform in, in turn our agriculture, health, education systems, and so on. Similarly, we need to bring in big reforms in the use of science and technology in partnership with industry and academia in agriculture, health, and in education. Those kinds of changes are happening in those sectors as also with defense. So I think we're seeing a movement very speedily into close cooperation, which is outcome driven. You know, what have we got out from these kinds of uh, changes in solving specific problems, either fundamental or applied? Uh, and those outcome driven approaches rather than addressing a problem but not worrying about whether we are solving them or not uh, is I think a remarkable change. So talking about the emergent technologies like AI, IoT, 
blockchain technology. How would they prove to be game changers for India? Well, you know, let's take artificial intelligence. Typically, by artificial intelligence, in practice today, what people mean is machine learning and deep learning. And by, you know, machines learning, they need to have a set of data which they use to learn. So data is very critical, and therefore data laws which the government has now passed or passing are very, very important to make uh, artificial intelligence feasible on scale. But that feasibility of artificial intelligence should feed back into farmers and the health sector in terms of their decision making. But also, we should have a major education program which allows the learning of the tools of data handling and AI by as many people as feasible because knowledge is power. And today, the asymmetry of knowledge, asymmetry, asymmetry makes asymmetric power also in a rather substantial way. And therefore, it's very important that the tools of AI, the ability to handle data, be there in a much, much broader community. This will serve the strength of that community in terms of understanding the use of knowledge, but also makes India a powerhouse in exporting knowledge systems and their applications all over the world. But sir, the basic challenge remains the percolation of the benefits of these technologies. Yes, yes, absolutely. It is a big challenge. You know, it would be a mistake to think that these technologies are the answer. They are a necessary component of an answer which has many you know, parts to it. At the final stage, it has people. We need trained people in every sector, nurses, farmers, educationists, uh, you know, healthcare workers of various kinds, uh, people who deal with roadways, uh, and so on. So these people would be trained not only in their core discipline, but also in the use of technology to communicate to their customer base and use that in the most uh, you know, sensible way for interacting. So only then, with this last mile, will we have a percolation. Now, this last mile is a big challenge. Those of us who have access to technology easily might be much more amenable with seeing the fruits of that, uh, much more, um, you know, uh, better recipients of the few uh, fruits of that last mile. Others who don't have a smartphone or don't have access to the internet will not get that. And that is the divide which needs to be bridged. For that, we need people who go across in groups, uh, collect people in groups and have them access to the last mile in multiple ways. India has done that in many situations. We need to do that in this. But my point is not just that the fruits of the technology should be accessible <clears throat> in the last mile, but in addition, the understanding of the technology should also be accessible to the last mile so that the last mile is not exploited. Absolutely, and we also have to bridge that gap. Lastly, Professor Raghavan, we recently saw the Web Hub Summit. How do you think it is re-energizing our scientific ecosystem? Well, you know, science is uh, global, of course, because, you know, as we all know, knowledge is the only treasure which grows by sharing. So the more you share knowledge globally, the more knowledge you get. But more fundamentally today, the planet is um, ridden with major challenges due to climate change and consequential global heating, environmental damage, density of urban populations and quality of life. And these issues in multiple ways are universal. Also the myth that somehow Western countries, more developed countries as it were, are, you know, uh, in some ways solve the problem is completely shattered by the COVID pandemic. We can see how fragile uh, these systems are. So a global sharing of intellectual capabilities, intellectual, you know, camaraderie is very, very important in these times and the Vibe of Summit uh, heightened that. Right. Professor Raghavan, on that note, thank you so much for joining us and sharing that perspective with us. Thank you very much. Pleasure having you on the show, sir. Bye-bye. Take care, sir.
So that was to the point with Principal Scientific Advisor to Government of India, Professor Raghavan. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned to Rajasabha Television.